Hello and welcome once again to our NWBA online sermon for this second Sunday in Lent 2022. And obviously, as we are putting these together, we're doing so against the backdrop of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. And this week, it's been my privilege to hear stories of how Baptists in Ukraine and across Eastern Europe are providing support and refuge for those displaced by this war. So please visit our website where you can find out more about that and some resources to help you to continue to pray as we confront this terrible situation. And we will be thinking a little bit more about that too as we look at God's word together later. But in this season of Lent, I want to invite you today to put your eyes, as it were, to the cross and to remember again those events of Jesus' sacrifice. So let's do that using a classic hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. As we prepare to encounter God's enduring word together, let's pray. Faithful and forgiving God, when we look to your cross, we see your infinite love outpoured, your selfless sacrifice offered for the sake of our humanity. We see this world in all its brokenness embraced, the worst of human oppression and violence absorbed by an all-giving God. Despair and disbelief transformed into hope and healing. Here, the promises of salvation were confirmed and fulfilled through real and visible events as word became flesh and flesh was freely offered to be bruised and torn and broken that our lives might be restored. So fix our eyes on your cross, we pray, 
And just as we see beyond its injustice and brutality to the hope and salvation it secured, so may we see amidst all the pain and struggles of our world now that there is always reason to hope, that the cause of righteousness is always worthy of pursuing, that your purposes can never be overcome through human intent. And as we fix our eyes on you, so we recognise our own shortcomings, the extent of our wrongdoing and the cost of our mistakes. And yet, as we acknowledge our need of forgiveness, we do so with confidence that in your grace and mercy it will be freely given. And as we see your word embodied even in the brutal events of Calvary, open our hearts and our minds in this moment, we pray, that we might hear your Spirit's voice as we focus together on your word's timeless message. Through our crucified and risen Saviour, we pray. Amen. We read God's word together as we find it in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 12 and 17 to 18. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me, since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I shall gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arrange the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun had set, and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. When I was aged about 11 or 12, I discovered that my name meant lover of horses. Now, I very seldom use my full name, Philip, but as I indeed confirmed through my later study of New Testament Greek some years later, the name Philip does indeed mean just that. It comes from two Greek words, philos, which means to love, and hippos, which means horses. Now, I need to make clear that I'm not a great lover of horses. In fact, the very idea of riding something that has its own free will between the controls and what actually happens just seems like a bad one to me. I've only tried to ride a horse twice, and let's just say it didn't go well. 
and I remember remonstrating with my parents at the time as to why on earth they'd chosen this name for me. I mean, they, of course, had no idea that this was what it meant, and they just sort of somewhat bewilderedly said, well, it's just the name of one of Jesus' disciples, and if you are a child of a church-going family of my generation, you may remember that there was something of a trend at the time to only ever give your kids names that came from the Bible. And I think it was about that time that I also started to adopt the name Phil, which I think must admit these days pretty much everyone calls me, even my mum. But I want to stay with that experience for a moment. I discovered that my name meant lover of horses, and I wasn't and I didn't want to be a lover of horses, so my instinct was to change my name, change my name to fit the circumstances and the preferences of my life. Names, of course, are important. They have a legal status, but they also have emotional and social power too. You know, to call someone by name is to affirm them. To get someone's name wrong can be very upsetting for the person concerned, and it can be quite embarrassing if you're the one who's made that mistake. And unfortunately, I've done that a few times in my life. And of course, very often, those who deliberately want to dehumanise other people will deny them their name or reduce them to a number or a commodity. And in many of the cultures in which the narratives of the Bible take place, names have all of that significance and more as well. Your name really mattered. It was seen as defining you, as determining your destiny and your identity. And many of the names that appear in the stories of the Bible do have quite particular and specific meanings in the language in which they were originally written. But what you may say, does all of this have to do with our scripture reading today, which is the set lectionary passage for the second Sunday in Lent from the Old Testament? Well, it is, of course, one of the foundational narratives of the people of God. The story of Abraham, the founding father of their nation, and how God makes the promise that he will indeed fulfil that destiny. All good so far. But if you were particularly observant, you might notice that he was named in our scripture reading as Abram, not Abraham. Now, let me assure you, this wasn't because of a misspelling or a mispronunciation on our part. And yes, we are talking about the same bloke, but when he first appears in these ancient writings of the Old Testament, Abram was indeed his name. And the moment of change is actually recorded for us a couple of chapters later in Genesis 17, in an event that is deeply related to the one that we encountered together today from Genesis 15. And we're going to use this idea of names as one of the lenses through which to look at this story and, of course, to consider what it might have to say to us in our contemporary experience today. So let's start with that name, Abram, which literally means exalted father. Now, that's quite a nice name to have. It's certainly better than lover of horses. But that name became something of a barb in Abraham's flesh, so to speak, because he wasn't an exalted father. He wasn't even a humble father, because he wasn't a father at all. He and his wife, Sarah, had no children. And we see how significant an issue that was for him in the way that this story in Genesis chapter 15 unfolds. Because it's not God who originally brings up the issue that Abraham's got no children. It's Abraham himself. God appears to him, we're told, and simply announces, do not be afraid. I am your shield and your great reward. And it's Abraham who protests and says, well, how can you be any of that if I have no child? What's the point of a reward if there's no one to inherit it or just one of my household is going to inherit it? And I think it's worth pausing here and considering how that might reflect or not reflect the way in which we can sometimes engage with God. We have that one burning desire, that one issue that plagues and burdens us, that one concern or disappointment, that hurt or fear that completely dominates our thinking. 
and we cannot hear the promises of God. We can't fully recognize the goodness of God because we all too easily become susceptible to defining God through our own expectations or our own unfulfilled expectations. You know, we could perhaps interpret Abraham's response as, I don't want a shield. I don't want my reward to be you, O oh God. I want an heir. I want a child. My name is Exalted Father, and I'm the father of no one. Abraham defines himself in the light of his circumstances, not in the light of what God tells him. And it's in that moment that God invites him to do just that, to define himself in the light of God's promise. Look at the sky. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars, says God. And Abraham is faced with a simple choice. Do you remain defined by your circumstances now, or do you become defined by the promises of God? And we are told, Abraham believed in God's promise. Now there's a point that I really think we need to recognize before we go any further with this story. Because at one level, it can all look very simple. God presents himself to Abraham as his God. Abraham raises the number one concern in his life. God says, don't worry, it's sorted. Abraham believes it and all seems good. So does that mean that God will just fulfill our every longing and desire? Well, that is certainly how some people might be tempted to interpret this story. <laughs> But when we do, that can often feel leave, leave an awful lot of people feeling very hurt and very rejected and wondering, well, why doesn't God seem to respond to me in the same way? So let's maybe just pull back the lens a little bit and take in the bigger picture here. The account of Abraham's life begins a few chapters earlier in chapter 12, and it begins with a call and a promise of God. Leave your land, says God, go to a land I will show you, and I will make you the father of a great nation. And Abram obeyed and followed. So this whole business of being the father of a great nation was not something promised in response to Abram's complaint. It was God's initiative, God's long-standing initiative. And whatever happened to Abram happened because he became caught up in the purposes of God, not because God became caught up in the purposes of Abraham. And I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of that. And in fact, it's here that we pick up quite a common theme in our faith tradition. You know, if God was going to choose anyone to be the founders of his people, why on earth would he choose a childless couple? I mean, surely there were plenty of large and flourishing families around at the time that God could have used to fulfill this designation. Well, yes, there were. But God chose Abraham and Sarah because that is God's prerogative. And the question that they were confronted with was, will you be defined by your human circumstances or by the promise and the calling of God? But of course, that original promise of God had two dimensions to it. It was the promise of a nation, but it was also the promise of a land. And as we move back to our story for today, the one in chapter 15, we notice that this conversation between Abraham and God moves on to this very subject, because God goes on to reiterate that part of the promise too. And so in verse 7, God's statement continues, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. And this time, Abraham's reaction is quite different because he doesn't just believe it and have it counted as righteousness. He questions God. How can I know that I will gain possession of it? And quite why his reaction is so different this time, we don't really know. But I find God's response quite interesting. What does God do? Well, Abraham is invited to do some things that we, particularly those of us who live in a Western society, probably find very bizarre. Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove and a pigeon. Now that's some shopping list. 
and then he cuts the animals in two, lays them out on the ground, leaves the birds whole, frightens off some birds of prey that come pecking around for what they would probably have seen as quite a potential feast, and then has this strange vision. So, what on earth is going on here? Well, although this all seems a bit bizarre to us, it was apparently quite a common way of establishing a land covenant at the time. And when someone made a solemn promise to another, they would lay out an animal carcass in the way that is described here, and then they would walk between the two halves. And forgive the rather gruesome nature of this, but said walking between the parts was a sort of symbolic way of saying, well, may I come to the same end as this poor animal's come to if I ever break this promise? It was kind of your sign sealed and delivered of the day. So there we have it. And we may be tempted to say, therefore, that Abraham is making a solemn covenant with God. Well, no. Look again at the story. Abraham falls into a deep sleep, and it's a blazing torch and a smoking firepot that pass between the carcasses. Now again, there's a lot of symbolism going on here. The deep sleep doesn't just mean that Abraham nodded off, but it's a state that is often used to describe people when they meet with God. And the torch and the firepot are the symbols of God's presence, the blaze of glory, the smoke. So it's God who passes between the animal parts. This is not about Abraham making a solemn promise with God. It's about God making a solemn promise with Abraham. Now, there's a whole load of other stuff that's going on in this story too, some of which is quite difficult and demanding, not least around Abraham's attitude to Eliezer of Damascus. But I want to simply, simply stick with this presenting experience, because I think it has an immense relevance to our experience today, both in terms of what is happening in the world right now and also in this season of Lent. Abraham asks God how he can be sure that God's promise will be fulfilled. So how does God respond? Well, the very least God could have done was maybe to give Abraham and Sarah their much longed for child. I mean, just having one child is still a fair way off from being the father of a nation. But God chose not to. And there would be a fair amount of time yet to wait before Isaac did eventually come along, their son. And there's a whole other narrative that we might explore from the following chapter about the disasters that we cause when we seek to do God's work on God's behalf, but that's all for another day too. So God doesn't give them a child. Well, perhaps God should at least give them a few acres of this land as a down payment. Or maybe some marvellous vision where Abraham is whisked into the future and sees this land full of his descendants. But no, God doesn't do that either. What God offers is, at one level, far more simple, and yet at another level, infinitely more significant. God offers himself. The sign of my promise is the person that I am, says God. And in this act of covenant, I will place myself within your grasp. Your confidence does not come from what I provide or what I do, but who I am. Will you be defined by your circumstances or by who God is, by all that God is? That's the question that confronts us in this story. Now, some of us might well find ourselves in similar situations to those of Abraham and Sarah. It may be that we too are struggling with childlessness, or it might be something completely different. Perhaps we're concerned for a loved one. Perhaps we're trapped in circumstances that we just don't seem to be able to find our way out of. And we are asking God, how can we be certain? How can we trust in you? Why do our immediate experiences seem to resemble nothing of the promises and the hope that we find within our faith story? And while I do not in any way want to belittle those personal struggles, 
we might also look at the global situation at the moment and find ourselves asking very similar questions on a corporate scale. Why all this suffering? Why do those intent on evil seem to thrive? Why doesn't God do something about this terrible situation in Ukraine or for that matter in one of the many other places of the world where there's similar suffering and violence and injustice and oppression? Why can't we at least see some sign of God's intervention? But God invites us to trust in who he is. God doesn't leave Abraham with any immediate outcome. Just a deeper and more profound reiteration of God's promise. God invites Abraham to believe on the basis of who God is. God invites Abraham to re-encounter God's very self. And I sense that when we look at our world today with so much that causes us despair and dismay and even anger, God would have us hear again that invitation not to be defined by what is happening around us, but by the promises and the nature of the God that we serve. And of course, this is the season of Lent, a season in which we are particularly invited to re-encounter God and to recalibrate our perspectives on the basis of God's salvation story. And I can guess we can therefore begin to see why this is one of the episodes that we are traditionally invited to reflect on in this season of Lent. But let me take you back to that covenant ceremony. And you may remember that I said that the rather graphic symbolism that lay behind it was that it was partly making the covenant was a way of saying, may my blood be shed in the way this animal's blood's been shed if I ever break it. And it's God who takes on the identity of the covenant maker here. And if you joined us for the first Sunday of Lent as we met Jesus emerging from the desert to begin his ministry, you may remember that I pointed out that the road from the desert would eventually lead to a place of execution, a place of shed blood. God made a promise to Abraham. You will be the father of a nation that will be all the things that I have promised. And in this strange ceremony of which we read today, God says to Abraham, I'll put my very self on the line to ensure that this covenant promise is never broken. As Abraham sought assurance, God offered God's very self. And in this season of Lent, we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, God's very self come among us. God's very self making himself nothing and being born in human likeness. God's very self rejected, despised, but nonetheless so committed to his beloved humanity that he would follow the pathway to Calvary. God's very self delivering on the deal. And if you take a moment to look at the gospel reading from today's lectionary, You'll find God's very self in Jesus declaring that unfailing love even in the face of our rejection and folly. O oh, Jerusalem, says Jesus, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing and you were not willing. And we find those words in Chapter 13 of Luke's Gospel. And before us in that scene is the evidence of God having delivered on that promise made to Abraham. There is a land. There is a nation. There is a capital city. There is a people as numerous as the stars. All that Abraham was invited to believe in, in the face of so many contradictions, is now tangible and real. <laughs> Abraham has come out of the desert of his experience and he has emerged into a great nation. And it is a nation that was once even greater, but it's become a shadow of its former self because, as Jesus points out, it has consistently rejected this God 
stoned and abused God's prophetic messengers. This people have not kept their side of the covenant, even though they've been told again and again that this is the case. And how does God respond? The God who once walked between the animal carcasses and said, May my very self be destroyed if I do not keep my covenant? This God offers a lament of love. How I long to take you under my wing, to shelter and to love you as a mother might shelter its own young. So what does this God do? He allows himself to be destroyed anyway. He becomes that sacrifice so that this covenant might be established once again. This time not simply for one nation, but for the whole of humanity. And we look again at our world, a world in which nations rage against nations. And while many of us in the West may be particularly dismayed at the events in Ukraine at the moment, let's not forget nations like Syria, parts of Africa and other places in the world where such things are all too commonplace. And when we look at this world with all its contradictions, when we see God's good earth being invaded and fought over, when we see the sacredness of human life disregarded and destroyed, when we find ourselves asking all of those questions that generations of biblical writers have asked about why evil prospers and suffering prevails. We see a world like the Jerusalem over which Jesus lamented, that rejects its creator and abuses and ignores God's messengers. And we, like Abraham, might wonder whether we can continue to believe in the face of such contradictions. And in this season of Lent, we are invited to turn our eyes to the cross, to recognize that God's response to our questions and our struggles, God's reaction to the dismay and the anger that we obviously feel, <laughs> is not to give us explanations or interventions so much as to meet us again at the cross. God's very self, offered in loving sacrifice, is our assurance that goodness and righteousness will prevail. God's physical demonstration at the cross is that this covenant is secure, that those who trust in this God can indeed be assured of the promises of eternity. And yes, we may well feel something of God's heart, that longing to bring this broken, warring world under his protection and care. We can share in that lament that was so poignantly vocalised by Jesus, but we can also draw strength and comfort from knowing that God's goodness and mercy will prevail. We, like Abraham, <laughs> must not allow ourselves to be defined by the circumstances that are happening around us, but the covenant that God has given. We, like the man who became Abraham, are called to seek, to live as a, li sorry, to live as a living testament to our belief in God's coming kingdom, even if at times that is hard to detect. In his case, that eventually did mean changing his name to mean father of many. That became his ongoing testimony to his belief in what his eyes could not yet see. And we can fulfil that same calling, whatever our name might be. And so we finish again today with a reflection, a reflection that explores some of the themes that emerge from this story. And you can use that to encourage yourself to live out this calling that we've spoken of. So please feel free to use it as a standalone version that's available from our YouTube channel. Please share it with others if you think it can help them to find assurance in these difficult times. But let us not be defined by the world in which we find ourselves, but rather the God who made it. This is the season in which we pause on our journey through a world that is troubled and dismayed to remember your promises and reset our understanding 
in the light of who you are. We long for a world that is different, and in the face of its harsh realities, recall and remember that we are your people. Our identity is rooted in your being. This earth and all within it is yours, and you are not bound by our perceptions of what is possible. Desert places will always surround us, for life will ever bring its share of desolation. This world can feel like a wilderness, hostile, threatening, barren. The scenes that unfold before us and the roads we are forced to tread can seem to contradict the very truths and promises on which our faith is founded. Yet this is faith, to choose to believe that when we walk in darkness, there is still light. Though evil may prevail, goodness has not been overcome. When despair seems all-consuming, hope cannot be extinguished. For our trust is in you, and no earthly situation can ever be greater than the magnitude of who you are. So help us to see beyond this desert place, to set our sights on more than what we see around us. For while we are not indifferent to the pain and suffering that causes our despair, we will not abandon the promises of your kingdom or cease to strive for its coming in the midst of our here and now.